Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sharon McCune. I am the associate producer and the curator of the Expand the Canon series here at Picked Classic Theater. Thank you for joining us for a very lively discussion, I am sure. If we could start, please, with our land acknowledgement. We ask for a moment to acknowledge the traditional lands of those who came before and celebrate those who are here today in what is known in the present day as the greater Pittsburgh region. The Erie, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy made up of the Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Seneca, Tuscarora, and Cayuga, Kaskaskia, Lenape, Massawomek, Mississauga, Osage, Shawanwaki, Shawnee, Susquehannock, Wyandot, Yuchi, and the pre-European contact cultures of the Adena, Hopewell, and Menangihala. I thank you. Um, welcome to this, our last and final webinar of the 25th anniversary season and our inaugural season of the Expand the Canon series. We will be discussing A Bold Stroke for a Wife by Susanna Saltbeef. And I have a marvelous group of compatriots to lead me on this primrose path. So let me start the introductions, please. Well, joining us today will be our director, Elena Alexandratos. She is thrilled to have all of you here, this delicious romp into the world of 1700s. Bridgerton ain't got nothing on Susanna Saltleaf. Miss Alexandratos is an actor, singer, and director in our fair city before the plague this time around. She directed Julius Caesar, the first all-female production for Pittsburgh Shakespeare in the Parks. Some of her favorite directorial projects have been Into the Woods for Duquesne University and Dr. Korshak and the Children for the JCC. Elena is also a coach specializing in Shakespeare and the classics. Next, we have Misty G. Anderson is the James R. Cox Professor of English and holds courtesy appointments in both the theater and religious studies departments at the University of Tennessee. Anderson is the author of Imagining Metho Methodism in 18th Century Britain, Enthusiasm, Belief, and the Borders of the Self, and Female Playwrights and 18th Century Comedy, Negotiating Marriage on the London Stage, as well as numerous articles on 18th Century Theater, Women Writers, and Comedy. She is co-editor of the Routledge Anthology of Restoration and 18th Century Drama, Volumes 1 and 2, along with Daniel Quinn and the next person I will introduce, Christina Straub. And she is at work on a third monograph, God on Stage. She is one of the founders of the R18 Collective, which supports professional productions of plays from 1660 to 1800 that provide the genealogies of race, gender, sex, capital, and environmental impact shaping our present. And finally, and certainly not least, Christina Straub is Professor Emerita at, of, excuse me, Literary and Cultural Studies at Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon University, where she taught 18th century British studies, theater and performance studies, gender studies and sexual, sexuality studies. She is the author of Divided Fictions, Fanny Burney and Feminine Strategy, Sexual Suspects, 18th Century Players and Sexual Ideology, and Domestic Affairs, Intimacy, Eroticism and Violence Between Servants and Masters in 18th Century Britain, as well as numerous articles on 18th Century Theater, Sexuality and Gender. She has just published an essay on 18th century adaptations of The Tempest for borrowers and lenders, and an essay on censorship and the 18th century London entertainment in industry, excuse me, to be included in the censorship of the British theater for Cambridge University Press. She co-curated Will and Jane, Shakespeare, Austin, and literary celebrity at the Folger Shakespeare Library with Janine Barchas, or Barkas, Christina will correct me, and has co-edited two new anthologies of 18th century drama with Misty Anderson and Daniel O'Quinn for Rutledge Press. She just finished co-editing co with Nora Nachumi, Making Stars, Biography and Celebrity in 18th Century Britain, a collection of essays on the relationship between celebrity and biography in the 18th century. Her current scholarly project, a book entitled Public Knowledge and the Problem of Inclusion in 18th Century British Commercial Entertainment, examines archival evidence of how theater and other forms of popular entertainment contributed to modern ideas of public knowledge. Thank you everybody for getting through all of that with me as I stumbled. Please welcome Elena, Misty, and Christina. 
Hello. Thank you. Thank Hi, everybody. You. Thanks for getting through all that with me. Thanks for sharing. I definitely <laughs> have to edit my biography down. I'm nah, so sorry. Nah, <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Thank you for joining, everybody. Um, so let's start by, um, well, whoever wants to jump in, but if we want to go in alphabetical order, that's great. A um, little bit of background. I know that Misty and Christina, of course, I just said it in your bios, you two know each other, but if you could explain how you know each other a little bit. But why did you get into your very specific areas of study? Elena, how did you get into acting and directing? You get to go first, Elena, because I'm at you. So, so at four years old, I was uh, I was the Eloise of the of the opera world. My my parents were both opera singers. Mama was Tosca and Daddy was Scarpia, and I am the love child of that union. And I knew I wanted to be an actor, and I knew that I wanted to to live on that in that world. Um, I have been on the stage. Uh, since I was 19, uh, professionally, um, mostly doing old dead white guy plays, um, Shakespeare mostly, um, a little Moliere. Um, I studied Commedia dell'arte in, uh, in Arezzo in Italy and, um, have just, uh, have, have built a career around being a stage actor occasionally doing voice work and things like that. My my passion is for an, another time period uh, for many reasons, but I, I love the, the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century worlds because, because they're so complicated and they're so much fun and we don't live in them any world, anymore. I mean, who wears a corset to go food shopping? I mean, Maybe some people do, but I don't. You actually do, yeah. yes. <laughs> well, there was that one time, but it was, I was right. going <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I, I come to, I come to theater being, being, have, having been a, a theater child in, in that world. Awesome. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Cool. Okay. Cool. Missy, Christina, who wants to go first? How did you how did you choose like what led you to down your primrose path to specifically 18th century gender okay. studies? Go. That's okay. Yeah. Um, well, I um, a good teacher, as is often the case, uh, led me to the 18th century. Um, but I actually started my career being interested in women writers. I did a book on a woman novelist. And um, then basically the archive uh, of my second book tour took me to the theater. Um, I started reading all of this stuff that nobody ever read particularly about this guy named Collie Sibber, who uh, was an actor and managed the London theaters for many years and uh, ended up writing a book about actors. Um, and I found that a very interesting subject. And all of a sudden, because I'd written a book about actors, everybody decided I was a theater scholar. And when I, when I sort of took a look at where that path went, I decided it was pretty interesting. Um, and the rest to say, say is this. I love it. Misty, your yeah. turn. You're going to hear some similar themes in my story. Uh, it, it Great teachers brought me to 18th century studies. Uh, I think I was destined to be an English major, um, but it was taking classes with Jill Campbell and Margaret Duty that made me discover this particular moment in history where uh, I think that so many of the scripts that still apply today about gender and sexuality are being written. And I was fascinated by the ways that I could see that. Um, I also did uh, a lot of reader's theater when I was in graduate school and just became more and more fascinated by the plays in this period. So my first book, Female Playwrights and 18th Century Comedy, um, was looking at the first bunch of women who made a living writing for the stage because it felt like it was important to undo the story that somehow women only toiled in obscurity or didn't have popular success. So I'm really excited to be talking about Sant Leave today. Um, 
And uh, my work since then has really been guided by colleagues like Christina, uh, so many fantastic scholars in 18th century studies who are just part of this dialogue that's ongoing. I feel very, very fortunate um, to have to have colleagues who continue to challenge me and uh, we're always teaching each other new things. That's awesome. Well done, everybody. Yay! <laughs> um, so we had, uh, when I when I chose the, this particular, the Expand the Canon series, right, is to, is to highlight playwrights and stories, right, um, and perspectives that have long been held silent. So we started with uh, women, we started with people of color and then LGBTQIA+. So when I was looking for stories to tell, um, I stumbled across, right, because sometimes uh, uh, sites will give you, you know, the, the smallest synopsis. Um, but I think this one actually led off with, well, if you if you enjoy Merchant of Venice, and I went, oh, well, okay, I'll look at that, sure, because, right, if we go off of, yes, Portia is choosing, has to have somebody choose her by picking the right casket that her father has left, right? So she has actually no say whatsoever in who she gets to marry, right? So so I started reading more um, of this particular play, A Bold Stroke for a Wife, and I thought, well, oh, that's uh, that's kind of, wow, this is so much more dense than A Merchant of Venice. Why, why mm -hmm. compare it to Merchant of Venice? Except for somebody else is in charge of somebody else's future, right? And the only thing that these four people agree on is that they will never agree. Well, that's just a setup for a nightmare, isn't it? But okay, so um, that's why I chose this play, the general gist of it. So before I, before we did casting, I chose directors first. So I had Elena in mind months ago to do this, to do this show. So. Um, I think she said yes first, then she read it. So why, <laughs> right? Because for some reason, sweet people do that for me. So Elena, what, what speaks to you about this particular play? And then I would like, once uh, Misty pops back on, Christina, if you could jump in then. Why, and I know it's a very broad and general question, but why is this play important? And why, what do you like about this particular play when it comes to the overall work of um, this particular playwright? And then we'll also delve, and then we'll delve into more about her work and more about her life um, of what we know. So, Elena, with you, what do what what do you like? What do you love? What do you find challenging about this particular play? How does it? What does it say to you? What does it speak to you about? So what I what I like about this play is the fact that it employs lots of actors. Number one. Number two, what I what I like and love about this play is that this female writer wrote such a smart, uh, clever, which are not the same thing, uh, clever play. Whether or not she was writing it in terms of thinking, uh, I'm going to write a political. Uh, um, um, love letter. Um, it, it, it is what it, it is that there's there's a politicism about it that I fell in love with. I love smart plays. I love smart playwrights. I love being able to have the the words uh, play dance. Um, I, I I look at plays with music or or with music I, I i hear the i hear the rhythm of it and and it's great rhythm you know i, I I'm already i feel a little contained because this is just a staged reading this will be a staged reading that we're doing it's not just a staged reading it's a staged reading so you know where i'm thinking sometimes oh then this could happen and then this could, no that can't not in a staged reading sorry <laughs> right um so love that, love that, um, and I love the, I love the, I love the different stock characters. Like the like the four guardians are can can look very stock charactery, but there's something about them that has soul. Uh, my favorite character in the whole play, 
is Sackbutt because he is he is Falstaffian. He's got he's got a he's got a a knowledge about the world that they're all living in, and he's got a he's got a he's got a, a joie de vivre kind of feel to him that it, he's like he's like don't let it don't sweat the big stuff. It's all right. It's good. It's gonna be fine. You're gonna do good. You know, I, I love him. Um, so yeah, so that's what drew me to it. And then if I read a play, if I, if I start like reading it on my downtime and reading it and looking at it and going, oh yeah, we could do that. Or doing something else and I go, what was that scene again? And I read the scene again. So I'm going into that world of the play. So that's how, that's how it started. Yeah. Awesome. So Christine and Misty, wh whoever wants to go first, what, what is it about this play that, that we as new audience members to this particular playwright that we should be paying attention to? Why should we be paying attention to this particular playwright? And if you could then speak more either or tag team either or both of you, um, why is why is Susanna Salt Libre an important voice during this particular mm -hmm. period? Period. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, is it okay if I pick up on Sharon's last question? Why why Salt Libre? Um, mm -hmm. You know, in terms of box office success, Salt Libre was just absolute gold, almost sort of like a, a Neil Simon of the 18th century. These are plays that became part of the repertoire. Uh, she had four, what I would call massive hits, but she wrote about 12 plays and afterpieces um, that were staged. So this one is the last of her really big hits. Hmm. Um, Love it, the big hits. Yeah, I'll let I'll let Christina well, pick up because the well, what, you know it, the, the interesting thing is is that I bet if you go to your um, average college classroom and ask people who she is, um, no one will be able to answer you. Uh, mm -hmm. Her plays are not read; they didn't make it into the uh, English department curriculum, or for that matter, into the theater department curriculum, mm -hmm. and uh, that's a shame. Uh, because, first of all, as you said, Eleanor, they're great plays. <laughs> um, but, but secondly, um, as Misty said in her initial comments, um, these plays have so much to tell us about the history that we're working from now in the present moment. I mean, here's a woman with her hands tied. Um, you know, what does it take to dig her out of that hole? And it takes a lot. Um, it, it literally takes a village. And I love what you said about Sackbutt, Elena, because uh, he's like the man who makes it happen. Um, you know, Absolutely. You know, uh, so in terms of understanding our history and in terms of kind of recovering a, um, a, a whole body of theater, Salt Reeve isn't the only one um, that we've lost um, because, well, often because they were written by women. Um, or, and, and also because they don't always fit a model of what we think restoration comedy should be. Uh, you know, we're, we're not necessarily, as Misty often says, thinking big wigs and handkerchiefs and hola. Uh, we're talking about people who speak in a very real way that, that are very relatable. Um, and if that, that doesn't always fit into the style that we expect, but the mm -hmm. good theater. So can we, I was going to say, can we expand a bit more because this is actually something that I wanted to talk about. Um, Elena was talking about it being like a political love letter, right? So can we talk about um, how her writing uh, reflects the politics of the day and how, especially when it comes to democracy or representational government and how, um, how perhaps modern audiences might be able to make a connection there between what's happening now and what's ha what was happening then? I think this was in and out again, so I can start us off. Great. She can tag in. Um, 
Well, we're at a very interesting moment in 1718 when this play was first performed. Uh, this is the sort of first stirrings of the idea of representative government um, and a kind of more egalitarian society in which um, uh, your identity, your economic status, your social status is not immediately fixed by rank. Um, so, and, and Fainwell is a really nice example of that. Uh, that man is moving through society. Um, he's not staying in one place. Um, so that's a moment when uh, those kinds of politics are in the air. And, and Salt Lee grew up in a family that was very, was a, a Whig family. Um, that means they were basically um, not against the king necessarily, but against a sort of um, Tory, old fashioned royalist idea of government and more in favor of um, a more equitable, uh, more representative kind of rule. Um, and this is a really interesting thing for individuals like Fainwell, um, who is a soldier of no great economic power, uh, but also for women. Um, what does that sort of, you know, opening blossom of democracy hold out for in terms of a promise for women's rights and women's agency? Um, it's, it's a kind of moment of just, just barely dawning hope around those issues. Um, that's, that's kind of what I've got. It's mm -hmm. the, the 18th century, of course, sees um, a historical trajectory towards um, the, the American Revolution um, and then the French Revolution, um, the Haitian Revolution. Uh, there, there's this trajectory towards uh, rethinking government and social structure. And women are very, very much implicated in that trajectory. Uh, you know, thinking about a history of feminism, uh, we think about Mary Wollstonecraft at the end of the 18th century, but she's the product of people like Saint Lee who were uh, thinking and writing and, and having a huge public impact through the theater. Um, I think it's important to note when you talk about politics in Saint Lee that the theater in the 18th century is like the social media. Um, newspapers and theater are just burgeoning during this period. Um, at one point mid-century, a third of the population of London could all be in the theater on one night, um, given the, the available seating in the theater and the accessibility of tickets. So it's an incredibly important space uh, politically as well as socially and aesthetically. And all different social classes. It wouldn't just be the elite. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Women are an incredibly important part of the audience as well. Yeah. 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 And how do you think the, um, the politics, that hope of, um, that hope of democracy or that hope for democracy and, and egalitarian society, how do you think that was, I don't know about accepted, but um, accepted then as to what we're seeing. I think you had made um, the comment a few days ago, Christina, about Ukraine. Oh, let me have to remember what I said. <laughs> well, it was, it was, but it was, ta it was talking about that hope of democracy yeah. and, and how... Yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I do yeah. remember, and um, yeah, I think it's interesting to think about um, how this, how hopeful this play is about social mobility, about women's uh, shot at agency and a happy life um, of choice, and to think about the that hopefulness in relation to. On the one hand, what's happening in the Ukraine, uh, mm -hmm. which is a desperate fight uh, for democracy, mm -hmm. um, and where you know it's it's sort of been amazing how uh, the world is rallying around that flight, that fight. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, on the other hand, 
uh, you look at the sort of um, divisions and um, kind of bitter conflicts that are happening in the United States and also in what the recent French election is another example of uh, that democracy has also run a course that has not been a progress narrative. Uh, we, we are not ascending to heaven anytime soon. Um, and it's kind of important, to, I think, to remember the stakes of um, that, that hope that Sant Leave had uh, in 1718. Yeah, yeah. Um, Ellen, I'm going to shift it back to you for a moment. Is there is there something or any things um, that you've come across um, in working on the script uh, this week that have shown themselves to be problematic or something that you haven't understood? Not not in the frame of staged reading, just the play. Something that perhaps. Um, we haven't been able to, or you and actors haven't been able to flesh out because we're in a different century or because we need more. This is why I have Christina and Misty to give us more historical context. Is there anything that you've run into that seems problematic or that seems nobody's going to get this because it was written in the 18th century? Anything at all? I, I'm, I'm small, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, off the bat, no. Uh, however, like in staging it, in 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 the writing of it, Saint Livre had a had the luxury of long rehearsals and uh, mm -hmm. copious amounts of cast, and we don't have that luxury anymore. Uh, and I have all, I have uh, a, a magnificent eleven person cast, but I believe I have like seventeen or eighteen characters. So um, it's the orchestration of who who can do this, <laughs> who can do who can do the who could do this role, who could do the drawer role, who could you know, and and so I'm I'm it's the orchestration of it. In in the writing of it though, um, the the flavor the flavor of the time period was a prologue and an epilogue, and it's to it's to in case you missed it, <laughs> I imagine it's the it's the while you were in the bathroom this is what happened, kind of thing or oh you're late right. so this right. is what the story is going to be <laughs> or while you were standing in line for concessions this is right right, this is right. you know. Yeah. So, um, so uh, when you brought when you when you showed me the original script and it has a prologue, and you know it still keeps the in the in the old English, um, it, it still keeps the the prologue in it. I'm intrigued by that because you know the for me the staged reading is a is an experiment. You know we're we're in a we're in a lab. What works? What doesn't work? What 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 makes sense? So so right now I don't I don't have problems with the script. Uh, I think once once I see what a I, once I see on Sunday what the reaction is to to the audience, I will I will have a lot more um, post mortem that you know this is this and this is that. But right now it's. Geez, she's a smart dame. She was a really smart chick, man. She was. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I wish that I could say, well, you know, the, uh, the the four guardians are problematic, but they're not. They're they're necessary. They're they're there. They're there. And what I what I what I appreciate is that lovely isn't isn't all dewy eyed and like uh-huh whatever you say i'm gonna do oh god you know because i'm sure that when she's in bath and she meets fainwell she's like so there's just a little problem <laughs> it's just a little glitch that we have 
<laughs> and if you can if you can climb this mountain, exactly. I am so yours. <laughs> right. Yeah. But we have a little problem. You know, yeah. so I, I love that. There's mm -hmm. there's there's the there's the there's the the dramedy to it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, right. yeah, because she's, she, yeah. Yeah, she's into it. So well. Yeah, she's into it. And it puts her agency, right? Her choosing is now in this relationship with Fainwell. And the problem is the kinds of laws that can keep women from their own money. Uh, so all of those contractual problems play out um, with the guardians as she's kind of trying to trick her way through the legal problem that she has inherited quite literally. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And what a fun one to have. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and they're not sinister. The guardians aren't sinister. Right. They're just like, you just want to look at them and go like, dude, right. stop. <laughs> stop. Right. <laughs> Well, it's fun, right? And it's funny too because it's like everybody else comments are like, "Oh, that poor woman." <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. right. The first right, Fainwell shows up, and they're like, "Dude, we will so help you get her out of that mess. We're so <laughs> down with that." And I'm like, "Wow, that that took a very fast village. The village was yeah. built very quickly." And they're like, "Great, lovely woman, please get her out of this. That would be yeah. great." Yeah. And here's how we can help you with funny mustaches and clothes, um, right? <laughs> the, um, could you speak to, Christina and Missy, could you speak to um, any kind of history, which is right, always hard to find when we're, when we're looking at different um, centuries, but especially women, <laughs> right? Because, oh, shh, we, if we don't talk about them, they don't exist. But can you talk about, um, what, is, what do we know about Susanna Saltleaf? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, there, there's, there are myths and there's a little bit of reality that we do know. One of the myths is that she dressed as a boy and uh, followed, followed a boyfriend to college um, and passed there. That's probably just a story. We do know later on that she married, her maiden name was Carol, and so she married um, Joseph Santlever, who was one of the king's cooks. And she was always uh, worried about money, but finding ways to make money. Uh, she was a, a working playwright for most of her adult life and did a little bit of political propaganda on the side. Um, even addressed a poem to the king to petition for some more money for her husband. Uh, so a very, a, you know, a very dedicated theater professional, but a really scrappy personality too. I love it. I'd like to think she did dress as a boy and follow her. I'm like, well, he's going to get educated. Why can't I too? Here we go. <laughs> it's such a great story. And there are a lot of women who dress in men's clothes on stage. The breeches role was a very popular convention because you've only just had women on the stage playing women's parts um, for only about 50 years by the time this play comes along. Um, so there's a lot of gender play that is a part um, uh, of, of this script. And this one, you know, Christina was talking about its optimism earlier. And I do think there's always an optimism. Sontleaf wants to believe that you can work out a better deal in this world. <laughs> yeah. But in this one, she has, she's run through more optimistic scenarios in her other plays. Mm -hmm. And this one really is about what it means to have a bad deal. Right. This is a play about a bad deal. And the four guardians represent different aspects of bad deal culture for women. We have, you know, Mode Love, who's the old beau. He's kind of a restoration, aging restoration rake figure. You know, so that's kind of like old patriarchy, if you will. You know, you've got Periwinkle, this kind of obsessive collector scientific figure, you know, this... Um, who isn't very in touch with uh, with her reality? And you've got the you know trade love, just merchant, merchant, buy, buy um, uh, kind of culture where we even are calling stock prices in this play, right? When they go into the coffee house, mm -hmm. and then you've got the Quakers, right? Who are comedy gold, Obadiah Prim um, and Mrs. Prim, who are all about the sexual contract. 
right? That sexuality is the problem. So these different, um, these different ways in which English <laughs> culture at this time gave women a bad deal. And uh, you, you've got to negotiate all of them. Yeah, to get to, get to the end. <laughs> it's actually perfect that you brought up you brought up those social laws because I wanted to touch on something that um, uh, Christina had talked about. You talk about this particular period in time and social laws. Sure. Uh, just you know, just briefly, what it's one of the things that happens with this sort of. Um, first stirrings of a more democratic impulse about how society is organized and how government works. Um, you have um, also uh, an accompanying anxiety about what happens if you start letting people in the room, <laughs> to use the phrase from Hamilton, um, if you sort of start including people who have not been included in decision making about governance, about the way people should behave. So what it's interesting in, in terms of that anxiety, what happens in the 18th century is this outpouring of uh, social legislation that happens in Parliament. Um, in the course of the 18th century, there is way more, um, there are way more laws passed around uh, social policy um, than there had been in the previous two or three centuries. Um, and some of them are pretty amusing, actually. There's, there's one that I particularly liked that had to do with um, uh, public swearing, um, that um, you, had, you got fined uh, for using uh, blasphemous uh, or obscene language, um, and your fine was calibrated according to your social rank. And you've got to ask, how are they expecting to enforce this? I mean, <laughs> there's no police force even at this point, as if the police force could actually do anything about this. Right. Uh, but there's this, this sort of anxiety, but it's also coming, and I keep coming back to that word optimism because it is an optimism about, oh, well, if we just get the right uh, laws in place, everybody can behave and get along and we'll have a great sort of public uh, democracy. Mm. <laughs> this is making me think of like the fine jar. So once you collected the fines for swearing, <laughs> what were, mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. you could collect the, 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 the fines for swearing, what, were, what was that used for? What were the fines then? I, I assume they went in somebody's pocket. Sharon, I really doubt that any of those fines were ever collected. I seriously yeah. doubt it. But that kind of legislation is also really important for theater because th that impulse, that anxiety is also behind the passing of the Theater Licensing Act of 1737, which mandates that any play that's performed in the licensed London, London theaters must be run past the uh, Lord Chancellor. Uh, before and, and and a lot of plays got pulled and censored um, as a result. And that that law was in place until 1969. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, we're we're talking about um, you know we're talking about censorship. Really, we're talking about policing people's behavior. But the other side of that is a kind of we're going to make a theater that is so good for people that we, it will be a, an important instrument for making a, a, a moral and sane society. Well, and if it had to pass muster, right, just for censorship, how on earth did, did female playwrights, how did that happen then? Well, I mean, female playwrights are on stage. They're not getting censored for being women. What's being censored is uh, mostly political speech. I mean, that licensing act goes into place because theaters had become, as Christina mentioned earlier, places where society is processing its ideas about itself, and they're very influential. Popular culture has a lot of influence, and, and we get a kind of early popular culture out of this commercial theater, right? Where you can buy a ticket, you can buy a really cheap ticket, 
You can buy a super cheap ticket if you come in late and watch the last act in something called the after piece. So there's a lot of different parts of society flowing through. Again, more people being represented. Mm -hmm. But it's the political speech um, where the hammer really comes down. And I would say only at a secondary level, um, uh, sexuality. That's not so much the target, either in the content of the plays or in the, the sex of the playwright. It's more these sort of societies for the improvement of manners, again, an optimistic but potentially restrictive project, too, about how people could be taught to act in order to have a good society, right? Mm -hmm. There's an optimistic version of that. There's also a shadowy uh, totalitarian version of that. That's about what can be said on stage. Many states across this country right now are dealing with divisive concepts bills in, in education. You know, when are you actively censoring speech such that you're not really embodying the free society you claim to cherish? Right, mm -hmm. right. So do you know, by any that just made me think, do you know if and how many rewrites she did of this play to get the wording correct so that she was not censored so it could be done? Is there is there any kind well, of documentation for that anywhere? There, there are no known manuscripts, none that I know of, mm -hmm. uh, that, that are extant. Um, we have early printer copies. But she is writing before the great big licensing act, um, which is 1737. Mm -hmm. That It's after that point. And that's yeah. precipitated by things like the Beggar's Opera, but also Henry Fielding's political comedies and, and farces. So she's before it. But she does write about, um, in, in, a, in a prologue, uh, about uh, someone picking up one of her plays in the shop and then putting it down saying, oh, rot it, it's a woman's comedy. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that that's not censorship, but that, that sense that um, she maybe wasn't accorded as much respect. And we do know, you know, actresses made less, female playwrights almost certainly less at the box office. You know, you didn't get paid unless the show ran at least three nights. You got paid on the third night, so. That was Why is it that nothing ever changes? Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That was going to be a follow-up question. Was right. So how did how did playwrights get their money? And because again, women, how often do you think that uh, female playwrights were stiffed by the houses they were right? They were performing in and did not get their full. I'm going to let Misty take this because mm -hmm. oh, she's written a book on the subject. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sant Lever was always worried about money and she clearly didn't have enough. She did. She she died relatively uh, poor and her husband, you know, had a job I and mean, they weren't destitute. Um, but she was almost certainly having to struggle with the house managers to get her third night money and then benefit nights. So um, third night is when the playwright gets paid. So that means night six, night nine, right? The longer the play runs. But then you can also have an author's benefit night. And she was, she was arguing for these, which let us know that she, she received less money. I mean, she would, she would make, say, 25 to 50 pounds for selling a play. Um, but the, uh, the other place women got stiffed was selling the play. Um, when you sold to a printer, you got the money then. You're not getting royalties like we do now. And she complained about uh, being, you know, being underpaid for those. But if you want to get it printed, right, you know, you got to take the price you get. Right. You said that she wrote, she wrote to the king on behalf of her husband to get more money for him. Is yeah. there, like, what else did she have her hand in? <laughs> like, what else? Like, did she write political pamphlets, right? Because if she was, right, if, if it seems a little bit, easier or less intrusive if you throw it into a play and make it funny and lighter without going exactly. I want you to read this article and what this is what I wrote yeah. right so what else what else was she what else was she dabbling in 
Well, so she is she's a, a, a politically a Whig, right? We've already established that. And, and a lot of the early newspapers that uh, are coming out or are beginning to reflect political sensibilities, things like the Spectator Papers and the Tatler, um, we believe that she wrote uh, perhaps some pieces for the female Tatler. Um, there's also something called the Petticoat Plotter. So that, there would be occasional broadsides and um, short pieces, but most of these are anonymous. So we're not really sure exactly which ones um, are hers. We do know that she is making some side money um, writing pieces that would advance the Whig cause. So when she wrote to the uh, when she wrote to the king to plead for more money for her husband, it was a sort of comic poem, right? Hoping to attract attention to his cause, and she pleads for the extra money. And it's kind of funny because her husband's the butt of the joke a little bit. You know, he's he's sort of begging her for more and she can't support him. So would the king pay him more for being yeoman of the mouth? I mean, she's 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 very playful with gender politics. While um, and that doesn't there's it's not a radical approach, right? Mm -hmm. But it's a progressive approach. And she, I think that that's part of what makes her really fun for audiences now, really playable. I worked on um, uh, The Busybody in a professional production a few years ago. Audiences loved it. They felt that it, it felt more current to them than they thought. And we had a traditional dress um, show, you know, it was period dress. But some of those problems still feel present right um how does money and gender uh shape people's relationships and how they think about themselves um mm -hmm. you know and and what is it like to be in a profession or a, a social position where you're broke right or you're barely making it how do you make those arguments for yourself um yeah i would so that actually leads me into why because you've started to, you've started to hit upon this and then you got into busybody. So why, because there are, right, lots, but why her? Why is she so important? What what do we need to know about this particular playwright and why should we be reading more of her plays? Mm -hmm. You want Anybody? me to go first, Christina? I think I had uh, answered this a little bit earlier, so maybe we should pick up. Please. Okay. Yeah. Um, as one of the most popular playwrights in the 18th century, male or female, if we want to understand uh, some of how, some of where the sitcom comes from, some of where the sort of uh, the the gendered scripts that we live as our lives come from, we need to read playwrights like Son Lieber, and she's uh, she's not unique, but she is probably the most successful over the course of the long 18th century. She works through, again, and I, I, forgive me if I'm repeating myself, but I think it's so important that she takes contracts seriously as a proposition that could rebalance unequal power situations so that you have at least some kind of basically just arrangement. Right. Um, when you you have a contract with your landlord, your landlord has more goods than you do, but it's possible to negotiate inequalities through contracts. That's a fundamental Whiggish kind of commercial principle. And Son Lieber says that should work for gender, too. We ought to be able to figure this out. And by along the way, maybe we maybe I could as a playwright point out some of the ways that women ought not have to struggle so hard, why they have an inherent equality or they deserve equity in this situation. Um, but she's doing it while she's selling tickets, right? She's doing it as a popular artist. So this is going to be a kind of velvet glove proposition. Mm -hmm. um, and discovering those moments in the 21st century where you can see a woman making these kinds of arguments in public and, you know, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down, right? The, the jokes still work. <laughs> That's a happy discovery and maybe a little bit a sad discovery. Right? Right. Maybe it challenges our own optimism about where we are now. 
um, mm -hmm. because some things haven't gone away. Mm -hmm. right? To right. extend that just a little bit, uh, that whole idea of a contract is very much something that comes into play when she's thinking about marriage, too. Yes. Um, and the, the sort of teamwork that you see between Fame Will and Lovely. Um, yeah. Kind of the ideal that she has in mind for the marriage contract. Um, that this should be, um, you know, there should be some agreement. Uh, some of her plays, like The Wonder, are very interesting because the, uh, the, the um, female protagonist in that is, is the one who has integrity, um, despite the fact that her husband-to-be is constantly doubting her. And he's an utter kind of ass <laughs> about it. And it's a question of getting him into her space uh, so that he understands what she really is before they can have a marriage uh, that's going to work. And it's interesting because instead of falling down and crying when um, uh, her uh, her fiance uh, thinks that she's unfaithful, et cetera, et cetera, she's just like, well, he gets it together or he doesn't. Yep. Um, yep. And in that play in particular, too, um, the heroine stands by her girlfriend, yes. right? And and uh, against against Felix, the fiance, who's hot headed. Um, so she's she's looking at. I mean, she gives us these wonderfully strong female characters, mm -hmm. and she's reflecting on some of the things about marriage law that are beginning to change not revolutionary changes, but little cases where women get to control a portion of their money, where the court rules in favor uh, of a woman being able to have access to her money. Little, little glimmers um, like that, that for that an optimist, a legal optimist like Santleaf, uh, she could point to and say, okay, you know, it, it's, it's a little bit better than it was. We're beginning to imagine some kind of discourse of women uh, if not bearing rights, then at least bearing kind of full selfhood. Because the legal term for a married woman was a femme covert. Basically means she's covered. She's legally covered by the, uh, the legal identity of her husband. And these are women who have their own identities and who are negotiating that with these men beforehand um, so that they are visible, so that they continue, we can continue to imagine their existence. They're not pliant, like Elena was saying, not just like, oh, whatever you say, <laughs> they have uh, they, they have strong identities. What other, what other plays, um, so let's imagine that all these marvelous people who are watching this webinar were like, ah, oh, I gotta go to the library and check out an anthology of Susanna Saltleaf. <laughs> What, right. So and then, of course, they'll find out that they're going to have a very hard time finding them. So what plays? So what, let's say this is their this is their taste. A bold stroke for a wife. OK, now we now have a taste for Susanna Saltlever. I want to find more about her. So what what other plays do we now go to? Misty Go. Oh, my goodness. OK, we've got to read The Busy Body. Um, it's great. And you can actually see a portion uh, in a documentary that we did at UT about a production from about five years ago. Um, the Busy Body is fantastic. It's a hilarious show. Um, it's very, very playable. Um, she also wrote a play called The Bassett Table that's just wonderful, that features a female scientist. Um, that's lots of fun. And uh, the gamester, which was her first, um, her first hit. Christina mentioned the wonder, and the subtitle of the wonder is "A Woman Keeps a Secret." So that's the wonder. Um, um. It's a very funny play, but as Christina pointed out, Don Felix, the main boyfriend, is insufferable. So I've actually shared that play with artistic directors and other directors saying, wouldn't this be fun? And everyone came back and said, oh, yeah, but nobody would want to play Felix. He's such a jerk. Right. Um, but it's it's a really fun play. It's got a great Scottish colonel. And then this sort of Highlands footman named Gibby. You know, this stuff is comedy gold. 
Um, so if you want more of her plays, you've got all those. And she wrote some shorter pieces like the Gotham election. And uh, let's see, I'm trying to think of the, the, that those are, you know, Gamester, Busybody, uh, Wonder and Bold Stroke were her four really big box office plays. Yeah, well, this is why I love doing these. Yeah. See, look at all the look at all the wealth of information now we get to pass on to people. Just um, a footnote quickly to that what you just said. Interestingly enough, in response to the director who asked who would play Don Felix, the greatest actor of the 18th century, David Garrick, chose the wonder as his farewell performance in Drury Lane. Oh, yeah. wow. Which is kind of like how how does it happen that that was such a desirable role then that mm -hmm. I think about as a good role now. Mm -hmm. Sing, yeah. And what qualifies it as good? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Is, mm -hmm. it, is, it, is it the number of lines? <laughs> is it how much? <laughs> right. Is it how much time you have on stage? Right. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, I don't know. <laughs> that was a rhetorical question. I don't expect yeah. anybody to answer that question. You know, That's... because every every actor is different. Um, what? I know now that now that we 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 have uncovered. Thank you very much, honestly, um, everybody for for jumping right in. Now that we've given a little more background about this marvelous playwright, what do you each individually hope that the audience will come away with from seeing this? If yes, please get your tickets. They have to be reserved. But, um, but right, what do you hope they get out of hearing this play? Generally, anything. I'll, I'll jump in. I, I, I hope that they are A, entertained, and that in that entertainment, that then when, they, when they're driving home with their mother in tow, because it is on Mother's Day, <laughs> <laughs> um, that they start to to have a conversation about the fact that this play was written in the 18th century and that there are many, many different things that are still happening today. And that, you know, as Sting says, history will teach us nothing. We just keep repeating the same thing over and over again. And how funny it is. It, it's a funny play. It's a funny play. It's 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 also got it's got a lot of uh, it's got a lot of bodiness to it, which you don't realize that this you know it's a female playwright. <gasps> she has she has you know wonderful body moments that are that are glorious. So I, I want them to to have fun and enjoy the 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 few the couple of hours that they have. Uh, um, in, in the world of watching a live theater being spoken, live theater, mm -hmm. it's really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I would underscore the joy project too. I think we all need to just sort of revel in the pleasures of, uh, of good comedies and laughing together. Um, there's something to be said for that. And even the notion of entertainment, um, which we can be dismissive about is also a moment of congregating and community and and communal experience. But that said, I think that um, I would want people to see in this play, in addition to her comic genius and her great sense of physical comedy. I know you can't do all of the things in a reading, but really, really good physical comedy here is that the problem of the guardians is also a problem of imagining that you can control future generations. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that, you know, that um, approach to one's offspring or to the next generation is, a, is an inversion of the stewardship that we really should be thinking of. How do we, how do we keep the good things for them? This is a play about trying to keep the good things from her. And she's not going to put up with that. Um, but yeah, I think there's a good lesson there. Awesome. That's, that is lovely, guys. I will just second what you have to say and say, I already have my tickets. <laughs> and I can hardly wait. Like that, right there. <laughs> it is time to, uh, to wind down. So I want to thank you so much, Elena, Christina, 
Misty, thank you for sharing your time on this lovely afternoon. Um, please, everybody, yes, you have to reserve your tickets because seating is limited. So go to picktheater.org um, and uh, get your tickets for either 2 p.m. or 7 p.m. at Red of Shalom on Mother's Day and on behalf of all mothers, grandmothers, aunts, godmothers, stepmothers. Happy Mother's Day. Um, also, please uh, take time to visit picktheater.org and buy your tickets to our next main stage production, which is Endgame. It has a limited run. Reservations are required because there is limited seating. So as you can see on the scroll, May 12th through the 28th, 2022 at WQED, please visit pictheater.org. I want to thank once again, Elena, Misty, and Christina for joining me today. Thank you very much. And thank you to Catherine for being our director and producer today. Everybody, please have a lovely weekend. Take care of your mothers and stay safe.